I, um, I've been here a few years, uh, but missed last year. I missed last year because when it moved from Cheltenham, I realized that um, the site of Greenbelt was going to be a mile from where my parents lived. More of that a little later. But I suppose it's not um, a coincidence that I've decided to talk about Freud. <laughs> Freud and Augustine on the subject of helplessness. This is a talk I've never given before, and uh, I only have it semi-clear in my head, so if you'll forgive me, this is um, an original contribution. Uh, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for probably about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then I'm going to take some questions, and there's a microphone here where you're able to line up, and thank you. Uh, about uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, I started um, undergoing psychotherapy, which was a, a wonderful adventure in my life. And at the same time as having a two-weekly session with the amazing Susie Orbach, who uh, I love and saved my life, I also became friendly with uh, another psychotherapist, became a mate called Adam Phillips. And it's my conversations that I had with Adam that have really provoked this reflection and talk. Adam's a Freudian psychoanalyst and takes a fairly standard line about Freud, that Freud and religion are incompatible. And in a sense, this is a response to Adam. But before we come to Freud, I want to distinguish two different sorts of religion, two different sorts of Christianity. One of which I think is rightly criticized by Freud, and one of which says, I think, remarkably similar things, but obviously from a different age and in a different idiom. Pelagius, they said, was fat, full of porridge, a Scottish or a northern layman who came down to Rome, end of the fourth century, just at that fascinating point in human history where things are tipping from the ancient world until the Middle Ages. And he came down to Rome with a very simple message. The Rome, I imagine, he came down to was, and I have this in my head, that sort of I Claudius Rome of debauchery and orgies and um, people lying on chaise longues with grapes dangling in front of them. You know, the sort of caricature I have. That's what I have in my head as the Rome that Pelagius, uh, the Christian ascetic, came down to Rome. And his message was this, simple. His favorite quote from the scriptures was, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And because God commanded that we could be perfect, he wouldn't command what we couldn't do. So perfection is entirely possible for human beings, according to Pelagius. And how you achieve this perfection is by obeying the rules. Christianity's got a whole set of rules, and you obey the rules, and if you obey the rules, you go to heaven. That's, that's Pelagius for me in a nutshell. Now, at the same time as Pelagius, there is my great hero, St. Augustine. And St. Augustine thought that this was total bollocks. <laughs> it's a technical term. He thought it was total bollocks because as a... Well, Augustine, as you know, had a shady, complicated past. Um, he was a ladies' man. Um, he had a relationship that lasted a long time with a child. 
he tells us in his confessions, though he never tells us her name. He stole when he was a kid. His mum liked to drink. He was a, a man who understood the complexities of life. And when he heard Pelagius' preaching, he was offended. He was offended because he knew that human beings were not like this, that they were not capable of the sort of perfection that Pelagius required of them, us. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. For Augustine, human beings are fundamentally broken creatures. And because we're broken and essentially to my talk, unable to fix ourselves, we're not self-fixers, we require something other than ourselves to fix us. We require what he called grace. We require God. Now, I suppose Pelagius would think that he required God as well. But Pelagius' prescription, his understanding of Christianity, is basically that we, that we sort of save ourselves. We're self-savers. Because if we do keep the rules, if we tick the boxes, then God's role is a sort of a glorified compliance officer, really. Is that when we uh, turn up at the pearly gates, if we have ticked all the boxes, then God is required to let us in. We've done our part, now it's his turn to his, do his part. Augustine thought this was bad anthropology and also bad theology. It doesn't give God any saving work to do. For Augustine, we are fundamentally dependent creatures. We are dependent for fixing on that which is outside of our control. I'm going to say that again because I think it's so important. We are dependent for our fixing on something that is outside our control. We are vulnerable. And we are dependent upon this thing that we as Christians call grace. There's no grace in Pelagius. We don't require something outside of ourselves to fix ourselves. We are self-sufficient in our salvation. So, this Pelagian Christianity uh, was declared, best thing Christianity ever did, was declare this heretical. And yet, I suspect that Pelagian Christianity is still the most popular form of Christianity that there is. Keep the rules, tick the boxes, and there will be eternal consequences for you. For Augustine, we can't do it. We're too complicated. We have this thing called original sin. Original sin gets a very bad rap. Original sin gets a bad rap because people think it's about some hang-up that Christians have with sex. And it's true that Augustine was indeed sex-obsessed. But actually, original sin is something like a way of talking about fundamental human brokenness, that we cannot fix ourselves and that we need something outside of ourselves to fix ourselves. Maybe the best model, popular model, of Augustinian Christianity is Alcoholics Anonymous. I've always thought of churches as being 
at their best, a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. You turn up to this community of people who want to support each other, and the first thing you have to do is you have to confess your inability to do it on your own. That's the first thing you have to do. You, I cannot fix myself. I am unable to do this without help. You have to ask for help. And they try and secularize this model as much as possible by talking about a higher power. But basically, it's an Augustinian model of church, Alcoholics Anonymous. We turn up in this body of people who are all, as it were, there for the medicine, there for the healing, supporting each other and asking for help, acknowledging our vulnerability, acknowledging our dependency, acknowledging our helplessness. Helplessness. What Freud said is that Christianity is a program of denying our helplessness, of getting a big daddy in the sky to fix it for us. I think he misunderstands Christianity. Freud talks, like Augustine, a lot about babies and childhood and Pelagius. And for Freud, the trauma, and that's not too strong a word, of being a child, of being a baby, is, and listen to this phrase, because it's so like Augustine, we're unable to be in control of the sources of our own satisfaction. That's the thing about a baby. The baby is unable to be in control of the sources of his or her own satisfaction. So the breast, the mother, the source of life is either there or not there, but it's not subject to the child's will. The child cries, the child screams. Suddenly, the trauma is that I cannot control my own satisfaction. I cannot satisfy myself. I am dependent and wholly vulnerable on that which is other, the mother. Freud says that life is a recovery from childhood, from the trauma of childhood, from the trauma of a recognition that we are not able to satisfy ourselves, that we are helpless as a child. He calls this, and think of this connection with original sin, he calls this, and this is a quote, original helplessness. We are originally helpless. And this helplessness is so traumatic that we spend a lot of our lives developing strategies to mitigate the panic that this creates in us. Two strategies. One strategy is to deny the fact that we have those needs, the needs that can be unmet. I don't need you. I don't care about other people. There's a little story, uh, just to tell a little story, just to have something in your mind. A child wants to play Lego with his dad. Dad says, I can't at the moment, I've got to make this important phone call. And the child goes, oh, don't worry then, I didn't want to play Lego in the first place. Silly little story. What's going on? Don't worry then, I didn't want to play Lego in the first place. Of course the child wants to play Lego. But, the, but by being told you can't do it now, the child is facing the fact that he or she is not in control of the sources of their own satisfaction. Someone else has to do it with them, for them. They are dependent creatures. And the child's response in this story is to deny their need 
I didn't want to do it in the first place, to deny their vulnerability. The whole thing about therapy is a, a way of exposing the way we often sabotage ourselves, sabotage our own uh, needs and desires through various sorts of fear. Here's a classic instance. The child sabotages his or her own fear to play Lego, a, 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 a desire to play Lego, because they're frightened of facing their own vulnerability of being dependent upon someone else for the satisfaction of that need. So that's one strategy of, of, um, of dealing with helplessness, vulnerability. Pretend we don't have it. And you see tons of people like that, incredibly well-defended people, people who do not express or show or are comfortable with their need for other people, their need for that which is other. Another strategy is to acknowledge your need, but try and bully the world into meeting it. That's generally my strategy. So, I need you to do X. You're not going to do X. Well, I'm bloody well going to make sure you do do X. So, you become a sort of control freak, controlling the world so the world is there to meet your will. Again, because we are profoundly frightened by, because we've been traumatized by, this thing that Freud calls original helplessness. And some parents with their children are also frightened about it on their own behalf. When some mothers overfeed their children, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> when, when some mothers overfeed their children, one of the things that uh, that can be about is trying to stop the child desiring because the desiring, carrying with it the consequence that the desire will not be met, is so traumatic for the child. So you have to bung up the child, fill the child's desires, fill it up before they even start. Eat before you're even hungry. You're terrified of desire because desire carries with it the possibility that the desire will not be met. And so strangely, there can be strategies against us desiring, us wanting. The fear of helplessness can be a, the beginnings of a hostility to desire. And these days, just an aside, we're really phobic about desiring something but not having it. We're always wanting the, 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 the desire and the desire being met to happen one really quick. We were terrified of having a desire without... I mean, this is our shopping thing. This is our, this is our um, uh, filling us up, unable... I'm, I'm talking about me. I can't... I've never been able to go on retreats or um, sit silently or not be within 500 yards of a coffee shop or a restaurant terrifies me that I might have, and so I'm entirely a product of my time, fearing your own desire. So, one of the things that Freud also says, which is brilliant, he says, the original helplessness, which he describes, let me quote, as the terrifying impression of helplessness in childhood, the terrifying fear that the child is not able to satisfy their own cravings, is, he says, the beginnings of all morality. It's the beginnings of all morality. I think he's right about this. Because 
what it makes you realize is my need for others and their need for me. And that all human beings come stamped with fragile handle with care. That we're not omnipotent. That's the great heresy of Pelagius. The great heresy of Pelagius is that Pelagius wants human beings to be entirely in control of themselves, that we are all powerful. That's the fantasy that is consequent, the common fantasy that is consequent upon our fear of helplessness, our fear of fragility, that we are, I'm losing all my notes here, they're blowing away, Two exa it doesn't matter, I'll just make it up. <laughs> I'm going to give you two examples of this, um, this fear of vulnerability. And they're going to be in the classic areas, if you like, of sex and death. Um, I was writing about this the other day, and I apologize for what's to come next. I'll try and euphemize it as much as I can. Um, I was writing about Pelagian sex. And I said, the Pelagian, the Pelagian ideal of sex is masturbation. What I mean by that is auto-satisfaction. Because the fear of sex, and this is related to Freud, the fear of sex is the fear of exposure and vulnerability. That one is inherently vulnerable in so deep a way to the other to have our needs met. For Pelagius, auto-satisfaction is, I'm obviously calling Pelagius a very rude word here, if you understand me. <laughs> auto-satisfaction is uh, how we ought to be satisfied. Isn't it interesting that that word satisfaction can carry such a sexual charge, but can also carry a charge about a theological charge, um, that it's often the words used for, for salvation. For Freud, no helplessness, no satisfaction. Unless you are prepared to be vulnerable and helpless, ask for your needs to be met, then they can't actually be met. The thing about the Pelagian vision, the auto-satisfaction, auto-salvation, fear of helplessness, is actually it's a plot against desire in the end. Because it wants to stop you desiring. It wants to stop you desiring because you might desire things that you can't have, or you might desire people that won't want you, or you might desire things that will thwart you. Think about this with regard to God. Any sort of desire carries with itself the possibility that that desire will be unmet. And so, and that's constitutive of the human condition, Freud says. Absolutely ineluctable. That's, we're shot through with that. We can't do anything about it. Because if we're, if we want something, then that could be frustrated. So the thing that can always meet our desire, we will always have an ambivalence about, a t we will always have an ambivalence about that which can meet our desire. Whether that be God or your partner or whatever, we will have a structural ambivalence. We will love and hate the thing that we love and hate. We will love and hate the thing that we love and hate because we are aware that though this can satisfy us, this can also frustrate us, that our desires can be unmet. And so we will always have a profoundly ambivalent relationship to parents, to partners, and to God. 
That's sex. Death. It's possible I might cry in a minute. Last night, as I told you, I live a mile up the road. My parents live in Slipton, if you, if you pass through that on the way. I was in their cottage in Slipton last night. My mum sometimes reads my Guardian pieces. She didn't today or yesterday. She didn't read it online yesterday. She said, uh, I haven't stayed at home for quite a while, so we, nice shepherd's pie. She sat me down and she said, darling, I need to tell you something. I've decided when the time comes, I want to go to Dignitas. This was last night. And I, I don't know if you've, read, if you've read my Guardian piece today. My Guardian piece today was all about uh, how opposed I am to assisted dying. And I was really quite taken aback. I didn't quite know how to respond to this. And my mum started trying to describe what it was that she so feared such that she'd want to go to Switzerland. She described us going down to, wouldn't we have a lovely trip? We could all go down and have a big party all the way down, she said. And um, we could go to lots of nice restaurants and then we could, you could come back, bring my ashes back. She said, don't bring them back in a Tesco's bag, bring them back in a Harrods bag, she said. <laughs> it's like the bizarre conversations you have. And she said, darling, my mum's really house proud, really, really house proud. And she said, darling, I couldn't lie in bed and not have your father put the curtains right. I was just like, bloody hell, mum. What? There was a load of other things, but that's the thing that stuck in my head. It's just, I couldn't. I couldn't lie there and the house not be right and the weeds growing up in the garden and, and all I couldn't, I couldn't lie there if I was vulnerable. I couldn't lie there. I couldn't cope with my needs being unmet. I couldn't cope with the fear of that vulnerability. I couldn't cope almost with the fear of returning to what it's like to be a child when you're not in control of the sources of your own satisfaction. It seems to me that assisted suicide is another response to that fear of vulnerability, the fear of vulnerability as a child, or the fear of vulnerability that we might have when our powers begin to leave us. And at the heart of this, these days, is a model of liberal individualism in which we are persuaded to be and celebrated as individual units that look after ourselves. Self-satisfiers. It's the ultimate triumph of Pelagian ethics. I just don't want to live in a world like that. I want to live in a world in which I look after you and you look after me. And that's extremely vulnerable because you might not look after me and because I might not look after you. But actually, I want to be a bloody burden on my family when I get old. And actually, I want my mum to be a bloody burden on me when she does. <laughs> Freud was right about helplessness. No helplessness, no knowledge of helplessness, no ultimate satisfaction. Unless I ask you for help, you are not going to help me. Unless I ask you to be my lover, you are not going to be my lover. Unless I ask you to feed me, you're not going to feed me. If I pretend that those needs don't exist, they won't be met. I mean, I don't have to actually ask, but I have to acknowledge 
I have to understand my own vulnerability. And the same is true of God. There's times when I have lost sight of God, but I have never lost sight of my need for God. Happy are those who know their need of God. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are those who know their need of God. Need, you need him. You need God. That's why Pelagian Christianity is rubbish. You don't really need him. Just do the things you're told to do, tick the boxes, and all will be well. I think today Christians are profoundly countercultural. Profoundly countercultural because we are a group of people who generally, on the whole, do not accept the individuality, the self-satisfying, self-healing model of the self that is so prevalent in our culture. A model that is built on fear. Fear that you won't look after me. So I have to look after myself. A fear of dependency. A fear that goes right to the heart of what it is to be a human being. A fear that's there in the relation between the infant child and the breast. A fear that's there in the elderly and whether they're cared for. And we as a group, I think, have to say, we will care for you. And I do want you to care for me. And that second bit's really important. Expressing our need, expressing our vulnerability, expressing our helplessness. Augustine was so bloody right. We are not self-fixers. We cannot save ourselves. We require this thing called grace. And we are asked, we are called to be agents of God's grace to each other. We come stamped with this mark, fragile handle with care. And our mission is to be is to be that grace to each other whereby we don't retreat into a world. Mum, I will fix your curtains. I will try and fix your curtains. I may not always fix your curtains, but it's okay. It's okay to live with our needs not always being met, not being instantly met. Sometimes there is a deferral. I can't play Lego with you. I have to take a phone call, but I will play Lego with you. But ultimately, we have to be there for each other in order for us to acknowledge our own fragility and vulnerability. Helplessness is not a curse, it's a gift. Helplessness is not a curse, it's a gift. And that's the mission, that's our mission as Christians, to say this to the world. Our fragility as human beings is not a curse, it's a gift. And it's that by which we say to each other, I need you. Happy are those who know their need of God. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Oh.